The cascading water rapidly eats away at the rock fill. Minutes later, the entire volume of water explodes down the 244 meter drop and the superintendent's family are carried away by the water. In the 1950s, the demand for electricity in Missouri was on the rise and Union Electric, a major power company, started looking for efficient ways to meet this need. Elevation in Missouri ranges from 250 meters above sea level to 540 meters at the peak of the Tomsock Mountains in St. Louis. Union Electric thought hydroelectric power would provide the best source of reliable electricity in this terrain. Hydroelectric power harnesses the energy of flowing water through turbines, which convert kinetic energy to mechanical energy. The mechanical energy of the spinning turbine is converted into electrical energy using generators. But there aren't any natural rivers to fill a dam in the area, and so they turn to an innovative solution called pump storage. Although hydroelectric had been around since the 1850s, it wasn't until 1907 that pump storage came into use in Switzerland. The concept is straightforward and effective. Water is pumped from a lower reservoir to an upper reservoir during off-peak hours when demand for electricity is low and cheaper to produce. Later, during peak demand hours, this water is released downhill through turbines to generate electricity, providing a quick and powerful energy boost to the grid. In the 1930s, technology was developed to use the same turbine to pump water between reservoirs and act as a turbine to produce electricity. After surveying several locations, Union Electric chooses Prophet Mountain in southeast Missouri. The rugged and elevated terrain of Prophet Mountain provides a steep natural drop, perfect for generating energy with water and gravity. In 1960, construction begins on the Tomsock pumped storage plant. With the lower reservoir built along the east fork of the Black River and the upper reservoir at the top of Prophet Mountain, about 244 meters above the lower reservoir. The upper reservoir is designed to hold around 5.6 million cubic meters of water, allowing it to generate a massive output of electricity when released. The steep and rocky terrain makes it difficult to transport and set concrete, so engineers opt for a rock fill embankment. Its dam structure is made by piling up loose rocks to form a stable slope. Huge rocks and stones are placed at the base and stacked in layers to build up the embankment's shaped slope, which can distribute the water pressure evenly. The embankment is then lined with a concrete cover on the reservoir side called a facing, which will help prevent leaks. It acts as a barrier containing the water and protecting the inner layer of rock from erosion. But this method has a downside. Rockfill dams are prone to settlement, which means the rocks slowly shift and compress over time, creating low spots along the top of the structure. These spots, or low points, are vulnerable areas along the structure. To address this, a 3-meter concrete parapet wall is added along the top of the embankment to act as a protective barrier along the edge of the structure. This wall serves as a final barrier to contain splashing or rising water within the reservoir. The parapet wall has to be monitored and maintained because, like the rock fill, it's also vulnerable to settling. Uneven settling can create slight dips and valleys along the wall. In 1963, the Tomsock pump storage plant is fully operational. The dam has the capacity to generate 350 megawatts of electricity, making it the largest pump storage facility of its time. By the early 2000s, Union Electric, which is now Ameren UE, faces growing demand for electricity and needs to increase the operational capacity of Tomsock. When the plant opened, it was only operational for around 100 days a year, mainly through winter. Over time, that increased to nearly 300 days a year. By the early 2000s, the Tomsock pump storage plant is operating at almost three times its original capacity. Deregulation in the energy market allows Ameren UE to sell power freely, making it profitable to run Tomsock nearly all year round, which puts constant pressure on every part of the structure. The daily cycles add stress to the upper reservoir, like bending a paperclip back and forth. 
In 2004, Ameren UE installs a geomembrane liner along the reservoir's inner surface to improve efficiency and reduce leaks. The high-density polyethylene liner is a thin, waterproof sheet covering the reservoir's floor and sides. High polyethylene is a durable, flexible plastic that's resistant to impact, chemicals and corrosion. It's commonly used in geomembrane liners. The liner reduces the amount of water seeping through small cracks, which form when the rockfall construction settles unevenly. The high-density polyethylene geomembrane is designed to improve the watertight barrier between the reservoir water and the rockfill embankment. The liner prevents water from seeping into the porous rockfill below, which has led to a gradual loss of water volume. By stopping these leaks, the liner helps keep the reservoir at a higher level for longer periods, maximizing the amount of water available to generate power. Workers spread out massive sheets of the geomembrane and weld them together to cover the reservoir's surface. The sheets are anchored at the top along the parapet wall and around the perimeter of the reservoir's base to prevent them from shifting. With the liner in place, there are fewer leaks, which keeps more water in the system, and so the dam can be filled higher, reaching closer to the parapet wall. There are some drawbacks. The liner adds additional weight and stress points along the embankment. This creates a new risk. The embankment, parapet wall, and monitoring the dam systems are under higher pressure than before, especially since water levels are now closer to the top of the structure. Given the increased risk of strain on the aging structure, it's essential for the reservoir's monitoring and shutdown systems to operate reliably. With the higher water levels, even minor errors in the sensor readings can result in the water rising dangerously close to the parapet wall, where uneven settlement has already created low spots over the years. But storing water directly against the parapet wall isn't very common in dam operations because it creates an unusually high risk of overtopping or water flowing over the top of the wall if the sensors fail. Most dams are designed with concrete spillways to direct any overflow safely down a predetermined path and release excess water from a reservoir. A spillway prevents water from overtopping the dam, but Tom Sock doesn't have a spillway. To keep the reservoir safe, the plant relies on two main types of water level sensors, pressure transducers and Warwick conductivity probes. Pressure transducers are the main sensors installed along the reservoir slope to measure water pressure at specific points, converting that pressure into water level readings. The plant's control system uses these readings to keep the pumps running within safe limits. If the pressure shows that the water levels are too high, the system automatically shuts off the pump to stop more water being sent from the lower reservoir into the upper reservoir. During a routine maintenance check, engineers discover that several pressure transducers have detached from their mounts. The faulty sensors give inaccurate readings and the reservoir's water level often registers lower than it really is, sometimes by as much as 1.3 meters. The false reading allows the pumps to continue filling the reservoir even when it reaches the parapet wall. As a backup system, the Warwick conductivity probes are positioned just below the top of the parapet wall to detect water by measuring electrical conductivity. If water comes within 0.6 meters of the top of the wall, the conductivity probes detect the water and send a signal to shut off the pumps. There's a one minute delay between the time the probe detects water and when it's activated. The delay ensures that the pumps don't stop for splashes of water. But in some areas where the wall has settled into uneven dips, the sensors are less than half a meter to the top of the wall. The delay and positioning means the probes can miss the high water mark in these low spots and allow the water to continue rising beyond the point where the system should shut the pumps down. On the 25th of September 2005, winds from Hurricane Rita reach the area, and water splashes over the parapet wall, briefly overtopping it. Ameren UE operators recognize the risk and reduce the maximum allowable water level slightly, which temporarily turns off the pumps. Two days later, more water spills over the parapet wall, and the engineers and operators at Ameren UE can't understand why. 
they decreased the maximum water level, but the sensors still allow water to reach dangerously close to the top of the wall in the settled areas. One operator sends a memo to headquarters warning that repeated overtopping can erode the embankment, which could lead to a catastrophic failure. But instead of making immediate repairs, Ameren UE defer comprehensive fixes for around six months until spring, when routine maintenance is already scheduled. During maintenance, they'll calibrate the water level sensors and inspect the structural integrity of the embankment and parapet wall, then reinforce any areas of uneven settlement or low spots. They just need to get through winter when residents in the area use more energy to heat their homes. On the night of the 13th of December 2005, the Tomsock plant is running as usual, pumping water from the lower reservoir to the upper reservoir in preparation for the next morning's peak energy demands. One of the two main control systems has been mistakenly programmed to ignore readings from the backup Warwick conductivity probes on the parapet wall that's linked to one of the pumps. This programming oversight means that even as the water level rises dangerously high, one of the pumps continues operating even when the reservoir's levels exceed safe limits. As the water inches closer to the top of the parapet wall, the primary pressure transducers report water levels far lower than the actual level. On the one hand, the engineers think that the water levels are 1.3 meters lower than they actually are. And on the other hand, the actual water levels are above the 0.6 meter safety line from the top of the wall. The automatic kill switch to stop the pumps has been deactivated and there's no spillway to channel the overflow. At 0515 on the 14th of December, water spills over the parapet wall. One pump keeps operating and water surges over the top of the wall, eroding the rockfill embankment in a process called scouring. The erosion targets the vulnerable low points along the parapet wall where settlement has already created dips in the embankment. The cascading water rapidly eats away at the rockfill. Sections of the parapet wall lose structural support and collapse. Within just six minutes, there's a full breach and the entire volume of water in the upper reservoir explodes down the 244 meter drop. The breach at the Tomsock Dam releases an overwhelming torrent down Prophet Mountain, transforming the peaceful landscape into a path of destruction. With almost 5 million cubic meters of water flowing at an estimated 4,250 cubic meters per second, the flood surges forward with incredible force. This release is roughly the equivalent of a major river flow, but in a narrow, steep descent that amplifies its power. The cascading water strips away layers of soil, creating scour holes deep depressions carved into the mountainside where the water tears into the earth, leaving exposed bedrock in its wake. The force of the water uproots mature trees, boulders and soil. The debris accelerates downstream and intensifies the destructive power of the flood. In Johnson's shut-in state park, the flood's path leaves deep gouges in the landscape, turning wooded areas into bare rocky ground, exposing ancient granite formations buried under the soil for centuries. At the superintendent's residence in the park, the impact is immediate and catastrophic. Floodwaters pick up the house, sweeping it along with the forceful current nearly 400 meters downstream. Vehicles are lifted and tossed, battered and filled with silt. The superintendent's family are carried away by the floodwaters. They're injured and stranded among the wreckage, but they survive. As the flood continues down Prophet Mountain, it reaches Highway N, a key roadway in the area. The sudden influx of water submerges sections of the highway, transforming parts of it into a river. Cars and trucks are scattered and partially buried by the rushing water and debris. Culverts and drainage systems along the highway are overwhelmed and blocked. The force of the water bends guardrails and washes away sections of the road. In Johnson's Shut-Ins Park, the flood significantly alters the park's natural water channels. Sediment and large debris collect in areas along the Black River, clogging sections and diverting water into new pathways. This channel migration shifts the path of rivers, leaving new pools, channels, and deposits throughout the park. 
The flood essentially changes the park's hydrology, creating new waterways, choking others, and turning the once clear riverbed into a muddy, debris-filled expanse. Search and rescue response teams arrive as news of the disaster spreads. Their initial priority is to locate and assist anyone in the flood path, especially in the downstream areas where the flood water still poses a risk. The National Weather Service issues flash flood warnings, alerting residents and giving them a chance to evacuate. Despite the devastation, the National Park absorbs most of the impact. There are no major towns in the direct path of the flood water and no lives are lost. The superintendent's son suffers the most severe injuries. He's hypothermic and is burned by the heat packs used by first responders to raise his temperature. Local authorities mobilize to assess the damage along Highway N where some vehicles are stranded. Environmental teams from the Missouri Department of Natural Resources evaluate the ecological damage to Johnson's shut-ins and the surrounding areas. They focus on assessing the riparian zones that are crucial for stabilizing riverbanks and providing habitats to the local wildlife. In the months following the disaster, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which regulates the transfer of electricity, natural gas and oil between states, launched an intensive investigation to determine exactly what went wrong. They recommended that future high-risk dams install redundant spillways, redundant monitoring systems, and they mandated regular sensor calibration and maintenance along with regulations for probes that are fully integrated into automatic shutdown systems. The Missouri Department of Natural Resources led efforts to restore Johnson's shut-in state park and the surrounding areas, focusing on repairing the damaged riparian zones along the Black River, which were stripped of vegetation and soil. While Johnson's shut-ins reopened to the public after several years, some areas retained the visible scars of the disaster. Ameren UE was fined $15 million for the breach. It ended up settling over $200 million in claims over the following years. In April 2010, the Tomsok Hydroelectric Pump Reservoir reopened for business. Mm -hmm.